Let's get started with our first presenter, Dr. Jerry Bacot. Dr. Bacot was trained at the University of Minnesota, Mayo Clinic, and the Royal College of Dentistry, Copenhagen, Denmark. For 27 years, he chaired the Diagnostic Science Department in two dental schools, West Virginia University and the University of Texas at, in Houston. He is co-author of the most popular textbook of oral pathology and has been president of the American Board of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathology, a senior visiting scientist of the Mayo Clinic, president of two national oral pathology organizations, and director of the American Cancer Society's National Board of Directors, and has won more than 50 teaching service and research awards and published more than 360 papers, abstracts, books and chapters. Please give a warm academy welcome to Jerry Bacot. I want to say that it's a pleasure to be here. I've got some really good friends in the audience and uh, they've been friends for decades now and uh, the older I get the more I appreciate old friends. Uh, they're really uh, uh, something valuable to me. I have, uh, I'm in the process of writing a review article of a topic that many of you are well aware of. Uh, initially, I called it NICO because there was so much controversy surrounding the previous name, which was Ratner's Bone Cyst. And then, of course, within five, 10 years, uh, NICO had all the same controversy associated with it. But I've been blessed, uh, truly blessed, uh, in being in on the very ground floor of some research that has been um, not so much mine, but it's been phenomenal uh, in the orthopedic surgery and orthopedic pathology literature. Uh, there weren't even names for the things that I was calling, uh, that I was diagnosing when I started back in the 80s looking at these uh, ischemic bone problems. And now uh, we have uh, about three or four different uh, classification systems to choose from in uh, naming our, our diseases. I wanted to say that uh, I have been lecturing in uh, Richmond once a month. I go to give a half day seminar to a bunch of pediatric uh, dental residents. And uh, one of my old friends is the director of that program, John Uncle. And so I've been looking for odd things. And when you type in things like odd lips and odd tongues and odd mouths, on the internet, uh, when you Google those names, you get some of the weirdest things in the world. Uh, it's pretty amazing. But one of the cutest was a gal, I think her last name is Thompson. I've emailed her and she's given me permission to use uh, these pictures, but she's a, an artist and she just looks in a mirror and paints cartoon characters using her own lips. And it's, uh, she's got, I think, 40 or 50 of them online. This is just one of them. Well, since I've started out, as I mentioned, uh, sort of in the wandering in the wilderness, not knowing where any of us were going. Uh, I think it's uh, the whole topic of ischemic bone disease and uh, the pain associated with it and other things associated with it is starting to gel, but it's been such a slow process that I think it will continue to be maybe a decade or two before we're uh, really on top of this whole thing. So since I grew up in Minnesota and uh, Bob Dylan grew up in Minnesota, I use some of his quotes here. Something is happening here, but you don't know what it is. Do you, Dr. Jones? And that's very much true. I should say, by the way, I don't have any financial interest uh, in anything I'm going to be talking about. So um, as a matter of fact, I retired about three years ago. So we have an impression, as an oral pathologist, I have been amazed at how many people have told me they hate oral pathology, it's boring, it's, they just would rather not know anything about it. And I've not ever really run into any of my students that have been like that. Um, but I don't know if it's because I'm that great a teacher, I think it's just because I like weird stuff and pathology is all weird. And I kind of convey that feeling to my students. But this is another Bob Dylan quote, uh, common impression of oral path. You raise up your head and you ask, is this where it is? Somebody points to you and says, it's his. You say, what's mine? Someone else says, where what is? And you get the whole feeling, you know, it's, it's all Greek uh, to many, many uh, students and graduated dentists. And it doesn't have to be that way. 
I've been around the block. I told you I've retired now, and uh, my wife and I will be celebrating our 50th anniversary next next summer. So it's been a, been a good haul. And I want to say I've, I've been the lecturer on uh, several Galveston tours, uh, and it's a very pleasant trip. Uh, I would recommend it. You do that. Last summer, I was uh, the speaker on one of these 10-day Mediterranean cruises, and that's as a speaker, that's way too much. But I'd say that of all the things that uh, prepared me for getting involved in bone is my time at the Mayo Clinic. I, after my residency, I was on the faculty in Minnesota, but I was uh, expected to go off and learn things still. And I had money from the American Cancer Society to do that. And it doesn't happen like this anymore, but they just said, here's the money for three years. You do what you want. Send us a letter at the end of the year and tell us what you did. Um, a lot of freedom. So I spent a year at the Mayo Clinic under a guy named Dave Dahlin, who happened to have the, the standard textbook of bone pathology at the time. And then one of the last things I did uh, was go up to New York City. There's a bone hospital there called the New York uh, Hospital uh, for Special Specialty Hospital. I forget the exact name. Peter Bulo had the standard textbook of oral pathology, of uh, bone pathology. And he was kind enough to give me a whole week of his time, over 20 hours one-on-one -on -one looking at the microscope. Because I was trying to compare the stuff I was seeing with what he was seeing in the hip. And he was just matter of fact saying, oh yeah, of course, this is what it is, this is what it is. And uh, he was using all the same names that I used. When I started out with Dave Darlene, the word osteonecrosis never came up during a whole year. And now, of course, even in dentistry, uh, it's, uh, it's a standard thing to think about. So that's how far we've come uh, in all this time. And the, I, Dave Darlene happened to be a really, really good teacher and he only took one fellow a year. That, that person was right in his office, and uh, he just inspired me. I'm the only oral pathologist I know that really loves bone stuff. Nobody else cares unless it's a tumor. But I do want, for some of you who uh, are just seeing me for the first time, to let you know there was a time when I had a waistline. Uh, as a matter of fact, the last time I spoke in Reno, I was jogging, and I remember having a tough time the third day because of the altitude. Um, and of course, my jogging days are over now. And those are, of you who are young enough, I want you to look at that lower right-hand picture. Uh, this is what 44 years in dentistry is going to make you look like. Mm -hmm. I uh, went to West Virginia to have a few years in the mountains. We thought uh, that would be a fun thing to do. We had a little two-year-old boy, and uh, we, within six months, just fell in love with that state, and that's never, never stopped. But uh, the last 10 years of my career, I went to Houston. I was a chair of a department that was bigger than the whole dental school in West Virginia, and it was a fun time. Uh, a lot of stress, you can imagine, in a department that size. But I gave over 110 talks during that 10 years that I was down there all over the state of Texas. And I think I've been in more places in Texas than anybody else in the dental school. And people always uh, in Texas assume that you, you know that what they've got is the biggest and best. They don't brag about it. They just assume that you know this. And so I frequently would start my talks by telling them that, you know, West Virginia looks small compared to Texas. But we've had a saying in, in my state that if you flatten the mountains, we'd be bigger than Texas. And somebody did that. Using geological satellite data, they flatten the mountains and we're 90% the size of Texas. So that makes us a third largest state. If you've never seen the Texas Medical Center, it, it's a phenomenal thing. It was started by the dean of the dental school, who happened to be really good friends with the hospital right next door, which was called MD Anderson. And they got the legislature to approve this land as a medical center. And it's just a, it's a phenomenal place. Um, it's one of the few places in the world you'll see people walking around in their bathrobes uh, holding their, their um, drips on the, the little carts on wheels uh, just on the sidewalk. It, it also has uh, one of the best children's hospitals and, and uh, it just really is a, a very good, excellent place to uh, work. 
And it was built on competition, mostly the heart surgeons, uh, open heart surgery. But I asked lots of people there to do things for me in other institutions. I never had anybody say no or even give me a hard time about it. So uh, I enjoyed it. I stayed on until the new school, the new dental school was built and uh, was, uh, I think it's a pretty impressive place. West Virginia University is, um, used to be all one building when I got there. It's built on top of a hill. It is the largest building in the whole state uh, and uh, it's showing its wear and tear now, but the state is uh, not so well off financially and you would expect a certain amount of that. But I've found also that the students there are pretty much the same as Minnesota and Texas and the faculty, they're excellent faculty uh, in all kinds of uh, institutions. Jan mentioned that uh, I was the author, co-author of the most popular oral path textbook. Uh, we were told that it actually, a couple of years ago, became the most popular oral path book in all of history. Uh, I talked the other three into being, uh, to writing the book, and they wouldn't do it unless I helped, so that's really the only reason my name is on there. But I, when I retired, I opted out to the four, of the fourth edition, which just came out this year. And I'm on my front porch, uh, working away, doing a lot of things that I enjoy now. Although I'm back full time at WVU and uh, until they get a new oral pathologist, I can hardly wait to retire again. Some of you may have gone to my, my couple of websites. Uh, there was a lot of ischemic bone information on there. Uh, I had to take them down because they were old and uh, I've got to learn how to do all this uh, so that it will adapt to tablets and smartphones. But uh, we'll get that back up and running, that's our intention. In the meantime, uh, I have, many of you know about this, is a Boco to Go folder or file. It's in a Dropbox file with about 3,600 uh, photos. There's a folder in there with 14 modules called Troubled Bones, and it tells you pretty much anything you want to know about this ischemic stuff. All you have to do is write to me at uh, AOL, Boco at AOL, and I'll, I'll send you the link, or you can get the link from anybody. What I'd like to do is, uh, since a lot of it is fairly relevant to uh, what the world is doing today, I'd like to go through a bit of my own personal history and uh, the things that happened and why they happened and why uh, I wanted things to go in a certain direction. I'll start out by saying, first of all, that uh, I do, in fact, like weird things. I have one of the weirdest sense of humors of anybody I know. Those of you who know me think it's rather cornball humor, but that's kind of a Minnesota thing anyway. But years ago, I decided that, uh, that we have to have a law of oral pathology. And the, the first day I taught my students, if it's not normal, you have to give it a name. You can't just look at it and say, well, it's a bump. We'll leave it there or we'll, we'll do something. And if you want to give it a name, you can give it a name uh, that is amongst the 50 most common oral lesions, but you never really are giving a name unless it's such a classic example, like a staphne bone cyst or geographic tongue, that you can't think of anything else that would fit that category. So in order to be able to have a differential diagnosis, you literally have to have an understanding of a whole bunch of names, including some that are pretty uncommon. So it, when, when I, I first called it Boco and then uh, one of my uh, good friends who used to teach at WVU, she's now in Houston, Ashley Clark, uh, she and I have been working together. So this is now the Boco Clark, first law of oral path. You have to give it a name. And I'm the second generation of oral pathologists, so the names that uh, I had to come up with were names that I came up with. Uh, the guys in front of me named most of the things in oral path, so we, we got the leftovers, but uh, I have given names to over 40 different entities in my career. And most of those have stuck, uh, but there, there's a general rule of, of education, and certainly in pathology, that states said if it doesn't have a name, it never gets studied. Back in the 90s, I was very heavily into the hypercoagulation states. They were just 
becoming known and it became very obvious that in blood, if you don't have a test for something, you can never have a disease about that something. And they came up with all kinds of coagulation tests in the 90s. So we went from uh, four hypercoagulation states to almost 20. And now all of a sudden everybody's got 6% six, 6 of us in the Netherlands, 15% of the population has a, a excess tendency to clot. And I happen to be one of those individuals myself. But keep in mind as we're going through some of these things that uh, Green's Law, this isn't mine, uh, Green's Law of Debate does hold true here. Anything is possible if you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, this I put together a few months ago. Uh, there were 38 lesions, but I've since discovered a couple more. And we've got a new one coming out, uh, not a new disease, but it's been around about 120 years, but uh, we're giving it a better name than uh, it had before. And I don't know if I'll get to that or not. But let's uh, just go through some of this. I wanted to let you know that you know, many of you are working sort of like I did. You're out there in the wilderness and you're just sort of flying by the seat of your pants. Uh, and you are doing good things, you hope, and many of the times it is a good thing that you're doing. But some of these might not be related to biological dentistry and medicine, but probably this first one should be in everybody's uh, lexicon and everybody should understand this. Leukoplakia is one of the weirdest diseases that we have. Uh, the term was started in Germany, I think. Um, no, I think it was in Budapest. Uh, back in the 1870s, the term was used for people who, who had uh, the third stage of syphilis and they had these white patches on their tongue and about a fourth of them went on to become squamous cell carcinoma. Well, that's a pretty bad acting lesion, even though it looks very, very innocuous. And then we lost the name and medicine took it up and used it for the cervix. There is a leukoplakia of the bladder, leukoplakia of the larynx. And uh, now with the advent of research with HPV, we know that a lot of those lesions are HPV lesions. So we're back to square one. Dentistry is the only area of the health sciences that still uses the word leukoplakia. And uh, I was representing North America about 12, 13 years ago in London. We had a four-day symposium, WHO sponsored. We tried to get rid of the word leukoplakia. We tried to come up with something that was more logical, and it turns out there isn't anything. By definition, leukoplakia is a white patch. That's easy enough. It doesn't scrape off. That's easy enough. And you can't attribute a cause except tobacco. That's kind of a strange thing, but still easy enough. And here's the kicker. And you can't give it another diagnostic name. So you have to know every white patch that can occur in the mouth before you can even use this word leukoplakia. And this, is, this represents 80% of all the precancers in the mouth. And the mouth has more variety, a greater variety of precancers than any other part of the body. I mean, we're dealing in an area that is uh, pretty phenomenal from a pathology perspective. So uh, we were not able to change that. The, the head of the, the whole program admitted at the very end that he's so anti-leukoplakia that he, he just wanted to have, come up with anything but leukoplakia, and we couldn't. It does work, but it means that you have to know a wide variety of white lesions in order to be able to make the diagnosis. And it also means that in my career, leukoplakia has changed. You see here on the list, papilloma was once called leukoplakia. Lichen planus in my early career was called leukoplakia. Frictional keratosis is my name that I gave to this because it wasn't a precancer and we were calling it leukoplakia because it was a white patch. Alveolar keratosis was in the 90s. Uh, it was, it's those white patches you see often bilaterally on the retromolar pad and they look very thick and they're rough on the surface and microscopically we got nothing. We never see any dysplasia. So that has gone off the leukoplakia terminology. Um, a couple of years ago, I put the next one in, breastfeeding keratosis, because if you are a little baby and you are hyperactive and you're sucking and you're sucking whether you're sucking on a nipple or you're just sucking air, you can build up a callus on the inside of your lower lip. 
And uh, when that happens, a pediatrician looks at it and looks in their textbooks and uh, it's white. So therefore it must be candida. And the patient that I saw first uh, with this was already treated with mycostatin and the next step was going to be diflucan in a four month old baby. Um, not the best way of treating something that is pretty innocuous to begin with. So uh, I just talked the mother into not doing anything and within six months it was gone. So breastfeeding keratosis is a form of frictional keratosis. Um, Smokeless tobacco keratosis was also one of my early campaigns. Uh, especially when I went to West Virginia, they, 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 everybody was chewing. Everybody was chewing tobacco and the women were chewing tobacco, mostly the older women. And I could see where they kept the tobacco and uh, we just weren't finding cancers in those, those individuals. And when I quit uh, academics back in the early 90s, um, I decided, well, the state asked me to be the director, the dental director, and as part of that, I thought I should do some public research. So I used a very good uh, cancer registry and gathered the data and just came up with an incidence for West Virginia, the number one or number two um, chewing state in, in the country. And I was expecting us to have a lot more oral cancer. It turns out we had less than the national average and we had one fourth of right next door in Washington, D.C. So um, I was uh, pretty much called the devil in many different ways. The governor of the state got letters saying, you got to fire this guy, he's working for the tobacco companies. And uh, it was a real eye opener. And it was, uh, you've, many of you have run into that because you have ideas that are a little con contrary to um, the uh, standard. But as a matter of fact, I've won that fight. And now the white patches we call smokeless tobacco keratosis, we don't call leukoplakia. And uh, more recently, since I was in Texas, back in academics, I uh, happened to run into a whole bunch of abusers and uh, in, a, in a, our urgent care clinic. And I found uh, we reported 12 lesions. I'll show you a bunch of them. 12 lesions produced by cocaine that had never been reported before. Uh, and it wasn't because nobody cared. Obviously, we care about cocaine. But when I went to Texas, I didn't even know people put mushed up and moist cocaine powder in their upper lip. I just didn't know people put it in their mouths. And so uh, that is a pretty common thing, at least in the Houston area. And if you put it in that site, then it's going to be an irritant like smokeless tobacco is, and you will build up a white patch in that area. And cocaine keratosis, I had to make up some kind of a name. One of the problems we have is the last one, hairy leukoplakia in AIDS. If you have hairy leukoplakia of the tongue, it is in fact, you have AIDS. That's just one of the definitions. However, uh, of course it has to be confirmed with um, um, blood analysis, et cetera. But the person who put the word leukoplakia on this was not a neuropathologist, was not a pathologist. She's a good researcher, but she didn't understand the terminology. And so we've been trying to get rid of that name for years, but it's just so cute. You know, you can't, hairy, it looks like hairy tongue. You just, uh, it's just fun to talk about stuff with names like that. Mm -hmm. So what we have now in, leuco, in the leukoplakia literature is a much more pure form of the disease. And we would expect as follow-up studies go along that we will have a higher rate of of uh, malignant transformation. I looked at all the soft tissue lesions, uh, benign and malignant in the population around the Mayo Clinic. I'd go back there for several weeks, several months, every summer. Did that for about 20 years and um, abstracted over 8,000 people with mouth problems reported in the medical. This is only medical literature. And those uh, 8,000 people were in a population of about 70,000. So it gives you a little idea of what there is. And, and these were leukoplakias that were identified by MDs. So you would expect them to be the bigger ones, the uglier ones, whatever that means. And we had an 18% malignant transformation rate. And the Mayo Clinic is known for its follow-up studies. It's really, it's got that down very, very well. So uh, I think that will be the, f the future of the leukoplakias that we are now calling leukoplakia. Well, let's look at this smokeless tobacco keratosis. In the first place, it doesn't look like leukoplakia. Leukoplakia has sharp margins. And with this, we don't have sharp margins. Let me see. Can 
Do you see the arrow? You can't. All right, we'll go this way then. I mean, the characteristic, the distinction between smokeless tobacco keratosis and leukoplakia is the fact that the margins are so narrow. I mean, uh, are, are not sharp at all. The, the concentration, this is an, a, a combination of abrasion and a mild chemical burn of the mucosa. And where the tobacco is most concentrated, you would expect the worst damage. And then it fades out as you get uh, saliva diluting the toxins. And uh, the cancer risk is not so big. We think it's maybe one-tenth, maybe only one-twentieth of the risk of leukoplakia. And overall, leukoplakia probably has a four to five percent risk, lifetime risk of going on to cancer. So the risk is pretty small. It is a precancer, there's no doubt about it. If you're going to get a cancer, it's probably going to grow up in this white patch. But the biggest problem, you can see it right here. That abrasion and the vasoconstricting effect of the nicotine, it does something to the adjacent to mucosa. And we wear away, I think it's mostly abrasion, we literally wear it away. There's almost no inflammation involved. Even microscopically, we don't see much inflammation. And eventually the bone wears away. So I had uh, people in West Virginia who had uh, the, the root surface exposed almost all the way down to the apex. And this is all done painlessly. It's a phenomenal process, actually. But it is a process. It is uh, something that is pretty easy to see. And it doesn't fit the pattern of leukoplakia. Plus, if you quit chewing within one month or two months, it's gone. Then we have a problem. If, you, if it doesn't go away, now you have a white patch. You can't give a cause to it. <laughs> it doesn't scrape off. And you can't call it smokeless tobacco keratosis because there is no smokeless tobacco use. So now you have to call it leukoplakia. You see how confusing all of this gets? But at least, uh, at least now we're not confusing all the research projects by using the term leukoplakia for things that really aren't uh, leukoplakias. Frictional keratosis was another thing. I mean, these, these two were actual campaigns that I started back uh, just when I entered the profession uh, because it was so obvious to me. A, a little preface or, or explanation. When I went into oral path, it was a microscopic field. And I was trained in Minnesota. My oral path was there, and I knew the people in oral diagnosis. And I said, can I come and just watch? And can you give me a call when when uh, you have some interesting cases. And so I was one of maybe four or five people who first started seeing real people, patients, not just pieces of glass. And now every oral pathologist is trained that way. And actually the clinical oral path or oral medicine is a, the term that you might use for it, is uh, I think the most interesting and challenging of uh, our specialty. But we got rid of these things. Uh, we don't call a callus in the mouth leukoplakia anymore. And if you call it leukoplakia, that meant uh, you tried to get some normal, normal um, mucous membrane around it. And the surgery can be a little bit drastic. But now uh, it seems to be OK. And perhaps the best of these is chronic cheek bite. It's a name that was around before I got along here, came along. And uh, that should have told us, because that's a frictional keratosis. And there's never been a cancer developing out of that. Uh, we just were protected by saliva, I think. And then breastfeeding keratosis, here's an example of that in little baby. It just disappeared on its own. And uh, all we had to do was do a pap smear initially to see if there was any yeast in it, and that would have solved the problem. But that's uh, a little extra step that people just don't want to take, I guess. Some of you may have seen this kind of thing. There's a patch of the mucous membrane, builds up keratin, and then after a few years, the keratin just kind of peels right off. The first one I saw was uh, as a resident in Minnesota, and I've been collecting them so far. I have about eight cases in a lifetime, including my uh, past barber. So uh, I had good follow up with him. He'd show me his lip every time I had my hair cut. And this stuff goes on forever. We had a dental hygiene faculty member who had it of the oral floor. And it's really odd. There is no skin equivalent to this. What happens is we build up keratin, and the keratin just does not stick to the rest of the epithelium. So you can take your finger in there and peel it right off, and that's what people do. They, they take gauze or a washcloth and just peel it off every few days. 
It's no big deal. It isn't the sign of a systemic disease, but it's very, very strange that you would have uh, an extra part of the body built and then uh, not stick to the rest of the body. I had to make up a name, uh, idiopathic subcorneal acantholytic keratosis is pretty awkward, but Isaac is okay. So uh, we have uh, this and that is still in the process of uh, their new cases being developed all the time. Something kind of equivalent, I saw a bunch of people coming in from ortho. Uh, these are young people, teenagers and uh, uh, prepubescent, uh, and they don't have long appointments in ortho, uh, those initial ones getting their, their bands put on. And uh, they would end up with this crusting around their lips and it was initially assumed, I think logically, that it must be a herpes infection from maybe they stretched the lips and traumatized something and the herpes was activated, but it never went away. Just kept on and on and on. And you can see that upper left, uh, there's kind of a glistening to the lip because uh, the mother was putting Vaseline on it. And uh, that seems like a logical thing, but in fact, it turns out that this was yeast. This was candida, and candida loves to live under Vaseline, <laughs> so it was making everything worse. It never got beyond that. There are some candida diseases where it starts in the mouth, and then as a little baby grows and gets to be six, seven, eight, nine, it covers the whole face and crust, and then it wipes out the hair, and it seems to stop right about the level of the nipples and the genital area and the toes are also involved. Uh, so that's much more serious. This just never seems to go anywhere. And when we published that, that was before the uh, internet um, and email, we got probably over 200 letters, mostly from orthodontists, sometimes from pediatricians from all over the world saying, thank you. We've been seeing this for a long time, just didn't know what it was. Uh, the name was too awkward in this case, so now, uh, Candida chylitis is a, a term used for several candida lesions that are in the same category. And remember that, that sloughing excess keratin that I just told you about. Those people don't have any cause for it. But today we're living in a world where we have whitening toothpaste. And as a matter of fact, if you go or are a cosmetic, go to or are a cosmetic dentist, where aesthetics, that's sort of the prime thing in your practice. You have a lot of people who use lots of whitening products to make sure they have those smiley whites. In my own world, uh, for academic purposes, I, uh, I keep my lateral incisor crown on because uh, that's about 25 years old. And when I smile, you can see how discolored 25 years uh, uh, the rest of the teeth uh, uh, become. So it's just a, a, a little short academic moment. But right now, white is really in. And pure white, the pure white, the better. Well, what happens is the toothpaste settles down into the, usually it's the mandibular vestibule, sometimes a little on the oral floor. And it could be the anterior, posterior. And after the mouth is rinsed out after the tooth brushing, or using whiteners, uh, this stuff kind of settles in there and it produces a mild chemical burn. And you see on the, in the epithelium, there's extra keratin, just exactly what happens with smokeless tobacco. And then below that, we have a bunch of puffed up cells. We call that intracellular edema. And when we have a bunch of puffed up cells on the top of the epithelium, there are some genetic diseases that will have those. But mostly we just assume it is a chemical burn, a topical chemical burn. Aspirin, mild aspirin burn will have the same thing. And in this case, we don't know exactly what is happening, but uh, it seems to be universal. If you talk to that uh, aesthetic dentist, cosmetic dentist, he will say, oh, I see that multiple times, maybe half a dozen times a day. And it's very mild. It's not nearly as severe as the uh, Isaac that I mentioned earlier. But it is part of the world where we are doing some damage uh, and we're doing it probably knowingly because uh, every dentist probably sees this in their practice and uh, assume that it's no big deal. I just happened to have the first patient who got biopsied with this stuff and it was because she was cancer phobic. 
she went online and she said uh, she found that a white patch in the mouth means you're going to get cancer. So we had to biopsy it to solve her, to calm her mind. But this is what we found. We found not only that, that uh, the big puffy cells, the damaged cells on top, which is called etching in pathology, uh, but we also found that just below the level of the keratin, it's peeling away. And when you peel it away clinically, it's just like Isaac. There's just nothing there. It looks perfectly normal. So when we wrote this up, uh, we said, and, and I was amazed at how little information there is about this. Uh, in the journals, there's almost nothing. I had to go to Google uh, in order to find information. And most of the information they have, um, I, I ended up, uh, there's a comedian named Seth, I forget his last name. He's a pretty well-known comedian and he is, I gave him a bunch of biopsy bottles and he's got a bunch of his friends who are using all of these whitening products and they're, they're gonna spit or take, when they peel off this white stuff, they're gonna put it in the biopsy bottles. And I think it's just gonna be a layer of keratin. Uh, they call it slime mouth, slime mouth. Um, I, I think it's with us as long as we like white teeth and uh, I don't think it is causing any problem. It just is something that's strange and it's obvious something damaging that we are doing to ourselves. And I told you when I got to uh, West Virginia, and uh, not West Virginia, but Texas, uh, the cocaine issue became big. Uh, the urgent care clinic has uh, about 40% of its patients are, are um, um, addicts, uh, usually not alcoholic addicts, but other drugs. And we really got lucky because the head of that clinic, C.D. Johnson, I think I might have told some of you in this crowd, C.D. Johnson, we became good friends. He's a great guy, but he can get you, if you're a drug addict, he can sit down with you in an open clinic and get you to tell how often you, you take your cocaine what street corner you get it on, what it costs, who you're getting it from. And I ask the same questions, oh, I don't use cocaine. So because of CD's personality, I call him the world's best BSer, but because of his personality, we were able to find out when we saw these lesions, I would look at it and say, I have no idea, it shouldn't be there, whatever is, this is, or several of them, I would say, I've never seen this before. And so uh, we started to collect, not as a research project, but just an academic exercise, collect pictures of some of these, and I'll quickly go through uh, some of these. And keep in mind, uh, snuff and cocaine, snuff, tobacco, and cocaine at one time used to, be done, used to be taken by placing either one in this little pouch between the thumb and the first finger. When you stretch it out, you just put it in there and put it up your nose and snort. If you're a big reader like I am, uh, I've read a lot of the novels from the 1700s and 1800s from England, and the rich people were the ones they were talked about, and uh, they were into this stuff a lot. Cocaine has become a real problem uh, in this country now because it's cheap. Methamphetamine uh, took a whole bunch of the market, and that could be so cheap that uh, it's almost laughable how cheap that can be. And most recently, uh, heroin has become a real problem because it's cheap. And in West Virginia, in one of our towns, Huntington, West Virginia, about 100,000 people, in four hours, they had 29 overdoses about three weeks ago. And uh, it's because uh, the, the drug dealers know that if they sell their products in rural America, the police departments just aren't able to catch them. They can't cope with them. So it's become a problem all over the world now, all over the country, rural as well as urban. And you know a lot of that. So let's just look at some of these lesions. Uh, there's a fairly low pH in cocaine. Uh, it can be made improperly, in, in which case you'll have a real acid effect and it will burn the, the mucosa just as we see here. And this is uh, usually when they take cocaine, they put it, place it in their mouth, they put it up over the lateral incisor, or back in the, uh, where smoke of tobacco would go by the first and th second molars. So those are the areas you would see these kind of effects most often. And this patient had been keeping the cocaine there for so long that he had a bit of bone destruction as well as um, 
soft tissue destruction. And this could be peeled right off, just like an aspirin burn. And uh, people who use cocaine a lot tell us that if you have a toothache and you put cocaine over it, then that does help it, like an aspirin does help. It eventually harms it in the long run. But this is, uh, what do you call it? It's a cocaine burn, but uh, a lot of the burns, uh, all of these are burns in one way or another. So I called it cocaine pseudomembrane, and that's very descriptive, and it's nice, but it's not a word that you'd want to use. So if any of you can come up with a, uh, a new name for it, go for it. One of the weirdest things is, this is probably the mildest form of cocaine use, and that is you place it over the mucosa. Usually it's the uh, attached and unattached mucous membrane that gets affected. And you can see, I don't know if you can make it out here. Right up there, there's a little gray area. And that little gray area is, if you press on it, it doesn't change. There's no loss of vascularity compared to pressing on the tissues surrounding it. And uh, I think what this is, is just a chronic vasoconstriction. I'm losing my earphone here. It's a chronic vasoconstriction. Cocaine will, uh, has the capability of naturally cutting down the blood flow to the tissues it touches by 95% compared to epinephrine, which is 70, 75%. And that 95% can go on for hours. And it's the, the reason that cocaine snorters lose their, their septums because the cocaine powder just sticks to the membrane and the cartilage gets dried out because it's being fed only by that surface membrane. And the surface membrane doesn't have any blood flowing through it because of the cocaine. So uh, it's a very good explanation, but I think that uh, is, I haven't got a biopsy of one of these, but there's a little dip in the tissue, so it's a little thinner from the top. And uh, we use the word erosion for that, the dermatologists do, and so I call it cocaine erosion. This uh, is one that uh, I reported to the International Oral Path Group some time ago, uh, four or five years ago, and this is cocaine keratosis. It looks so much like leukoplakia that I think I couldn't tell the difference. And that was the term that I was giving to these until finally C.D. Johnson said, let me see if I can figure out what's going on. And then the guy said, oh, of course, that's where I put my cocaine. Crack powder, they do the same thing with and get the same effects. The lower picture on the left, on your left, is a um, uh, similar kind of a thing, but it's got an ulcer in the middle from a uh, ulcer, cocaine ulcer from a more acute, uh, more intense burn. And then sometimes the cocaine, when it's placed over a heavily keratinized surface, it gets this moth-eaten stuff. Uh, excoriation is the derm to uh, use for that. And then cocaine dehiscence. Uh, I'm sure that uh, I was a general dentist only for almost three years, but we had a few dehiscences. And back in my day, we were taught that that was because of occlusion. The, the tooth was uh, tipped one way or the other, and, and food was sluicing down into the marginal gingiva. And I think that theory is um, no longer very popular, and I'm not sure exactly what theories are popular, but uh, this is one thing now, when, whenever you see a dehiscence that has no other explanation, you have to think about this, because that's another place that cocaine is placed. Right, they press it between the teeth. And uh, the absorption, what, what people tell me, the absorption through the mouth is as good a high as it gets. It's better than uh, up through the nose. So uh, it's something that they're going to continue to do because it just feels good for them. But the places where they keep this stuff are causing some damage. And cocaine dehiscence is a combination of the dehiscence. Sometimes there's little inflammation, usually not. Uh, but the frenum is right there, and you can get either a keratin buildup or the frenum just looks very pale, like there's no blood in it. And uh, just to show you how characteristic this is, or tell you, some of you have probably heard this, but um, I was a department chair, so anybody who was well-to-do in Houston, uh, if they had an oral path type problem, they would come to see the department chair. And this gal came in in the middle of the summer with a fur coat on her, a true, real fur coat, and she didn't take it off when she got in the chair. And uh, she was there for lichen planus. Uh, I was just gonna confirm it, apparently. 
But I looked in the mouth and I, I, after I introduced myself, I looked in the mouth. First place I looked was inside the lips. And I said, oh, how often do you put your cocaine there? And she said, how did you know that? And she jumped out of the chair and that was the last I saw. So not a, not a real practice builder, I have to admit. But. And then we're all very familiar with osteonecrosis uh, back in 2003, 2004, when the bisphosphonate uh, world turned dentistry upside down. Um, the term osteonecrosis was almost never used before that outside of my colleagues and friends in here uh, because ischemic osteonecrosis is to researchers in bone, uh, bone marrow diseases. That's a sort of an umbrella term for all of these entities. Uh, whether it produces dead bone or not. But bisphosphonate osteonecrosis became a catchphrase, and then we found that other medications will do the same thing. So instead of bronze, it's uh, medication related, not bisphosphonate related. So it became um, bronze, I guess. Uh, that's where we're at right now. And osteonecrosis is, every dentist knows a lot of stuff about osteonecrosis. But we have another form here, and it makes sense because if somebody's topically putting some a huge, hugely effective vasoconstrictor over this uh, bone area, and then they get in a bar fight. Somebody, that's what happened to both of these individuals. They got in a fight, somebody knocked the teeth out in one and almost knocked the teeth out in the other, and the bone just never did heal. That one on top was like that, with no inflammation really of the soft tissues around it, for, I think I followed him, it's, it's hard to get people to follow you, uh, urgent care patients, but I saw him about 18 months later and he was exactly the same. He didn't have any pain and uh, this pattern is exactly what we see with bisphosphonate osteonecrosis for a whole different reason, a whole different mechanism. And of course, we've known for centuries that uh, we can have a blow through of the septum with uh, cocaine that uh, gets stuck to the septum and then also, uh, in somebody who's a really bad user, they just keep on using even though they have a hole and gravity pulls the powdered cocaine down and most of it collects on the lower part where the bone is and eventually it's strong enough to even kill the bone. And uh, a perforated palate, if you had a perforated palate back in the 1800s, 1840 to 1890s, and went to a physician, um, that physician would assume that you had either tuberculosis, third stage of syphilis, or cocaine abuse. Uh, those are the three big uh, palatal perforation diseases. Oops, sorry. And this took me forever. I saw it many times and didn't understand it, but you see some erosion of this molar little cupped out areas, and there's also abrasion that you can't quite see so well in two dimensions. But look at the other side, perfectly normal. And somebody who's grinding their teeth, uh, they might grind worse on one side or another, but I've never even heard of it being as bad as this. Plus, why get that dished out area? That's not an abrasion. Um, the first patient I saw with this was a bulimia patient. And so I assumed that it, she was somebody who had a little hiccup or something when she was vomiting and some of the stomach acid got onto her teeth, but it was only on one side. And now I'm sure that that was somebody who was using cocaine. It's just natural. Cocaine is a low pH. It's going to dissolve enamel. And it's also a powder, so there's a little grittiness to it. And the combination of erosion and, and uh, abrasion is natural but it's the only thing I know of that will do this only on one side. And then of course, crack is the same kind of thing. Somebody can come in and they burn their cell, themselves. Remember these are glass pipes, so it gets pretty hot. And there are acute uh, crack pipe induced lesions. Uh, the crack pipe stem burn. And then uh, the lower picture shows sort of a chronic callus and indentation because the skin has responded to the, the heat of the crack pipe. And then some people will just suck in really hard and they'll get some of that crystal sticking to parts of their uh, palate. So crack pipe uh, airstream burn, I, you can make up names as well as I can. There was no name in the literature for this, never had been reported. Uh, of course, uh, telltale sign is that little chip on the la lateral incisor where they keep the pipe. And this is the same kind of a thing. It's uh, somebody 
hiccups or sucks in the crack and uh, the crack crystals or the smaller ones get sucked up the pipe stem and land on the tongue and you end up with burns. Crack crystal burn. And then something that you've all seen, if you're a dentist, uh, you have seen people who have tongues that look like they're just covered with little fibromas. Um, and uh, that was something that I first saw 30 years ago, 35 years ago, had no name for it. So I just took a picture of it and we took a biopsy of a, a few of the bigger ones. If they had a burning sensation, we assumed it was yeast and we would give them yeast medication and it took care of the burning. But it was no big deal, and so we just let it go. And then when I retired or moved to Texas, I looked at all my boxes. I had the big word unknowns on the side. All these lesions of things that I had seen and didn't know what was causing them, where they came from, or what name they had. And I had over 20 cases of this with pictures and pretty good histories and follow-up on some of them. So I just got disgusted with my colleagues who I was waiting to do the job and, and write about this. And I wrote this up, chronic lingual papulosis. Had to make up a name. And uh, that came out in 2014. And that year, that was the most requested paper in Triple O, which is our main journal. Uh, the most requested reprints and downloads uh, in Triple O for that year. It's a silly little paper. All I did was give it a name, something that we've all seen, and we just, you know, if you haven't got a name for it, you can't really think about it. And histologically, here's, you can see, uh, these are, some of these are filiform, fungiform papillae because we have taste buds, and others were just big filiform papillae. They look like irritation fibromas microscopically. And there can be a little variation associated with this, and. Uh, we also found the anterior tips of mouth breathers of the tongue. Same kind of thing. If you go, if you have somebody with brown bumps on their tongue, you would, would go into the dental liter literature and find not a single name, nothing. There are three or four or five papers in the medical literature, pediatric literature. They call these uh, black tongue bumps or something like that. But uh, it's something that you've all seen probably from time to time. It is a variation of melanosis, maybe racial melanosis, physiologic melanosis, maybe drug-induced melanosis. But the tips of the fungiform papillae are fairly neural. That's where the taste buds, of course, have to come from. Uh, and so the tops of the fungiform papillae are, have a more neural characteristic and part of the very primitive neural formation of nerves is in the very earliest stages, uh, those same cells can make either nerve or melanocyte, melanin. So it makes sense that uh, you would have, in some instances, uh, this kind of funny pattern where just the tips of the uh, fungiform papillae are pigmented. It's no big deal. It's just a variation of normal, and it uh, kind of remains. But we didn't have a name. So now we have a name, papillary tip melanosis. And back in the 70s, I had this bone pathology fellowship under my belt. And uh, I, I got this uh, case, the upper, this case. It looked like a classic uh, endo case that had perforated through the cortex. But, uh, the, and usually it's a cortex perforation on both the palatal and the labial side. And so I was expecting it to be a, a little bit of scar tissue. That seems to be standard. But then when I called the surgeon, uh, he said, no, their, their cortex was completely intact. And he had an x-ray of this same thing from about 10 years earlier, and it looked the same. Well, now I have no explanation for this. And uh, I had to come up with a name. I called it a residual periapical scar. I didn't know if there was a periapical scar before. But in pathology, we had no name for something as simple as that. And it turns out, if you know bone, both of the jaws and the rest of the skeleton, then there are huge contrasts between those, those two sets of bone. And we're used to scar tissue in the alveolar processes. A periapical scar is no big deal in our, our lexicon. Uh, I had to make up a name if there is no apical location, so I called it intramedullary fibrous scar. But there is no such thing in any other bone in the body. There are no fibers in bone marrow, fatty marrow or hematopoietic marrow. There are none. 
So anytime we see fibrosis, it's got to be some kind of a pathologic process. And there is a term called myelofibrosis, which is generally thought to be a precursor to leukemia. And it really probably is because leukemia produces ischemia in the bone marrow, and then we get the normal ischemic effects. And scar tissue is an ischemic ph phenomenon. So think of that. Here we have something that's completely unique, and yet it's just very mundane, everyday stuff, at least microscopically. And some of these are so painful that the patients have been diagnosed with trigeminal neuralgia. And a surgeon goes in and just scrapes it out. I can't even find, I can't find embedded nerves. I can barely find blood vessels. And yet it's causing a huge amount of pain. And the pain is gone after they remove it. Uh, it's a very strange phenomenon. And I, I'm, I'm really interested in this. I've already presented about 180 cases to our academy. And uh, now that I'm retired, I'm in the process of writing a bunch of these uh, papers. Well, I, I was getting so many bone biopsies. A typical bone biopsy, marrow biopsy for an oral path lab is maybe five or six or seven a year, where somebody's interested in leukemia, essentially. I get 50 a week, um, and that's now in my retirement. Uh, when we were, I, I think I've, I've seen at least 14,000 bone marrow samples from the jaws. And that means I see a lot of normal as well as the abnormal. And in some of these normal, I found salivary glands. And salivary glands had never been reported inside the jaws. And yet we have salivary tumors, benign and malignant cancer, or tumors that develop inside the jaw with no external perforation, nothing connecting to the outside. So we had some really weird explanations for salivary tumors in the jaws. But then now that at least somebody had enough experience to see a bunch of these. I think we've got 20 or 30 of them now. Um, it makes sense. This is where those salivary uh, cancers come from. Focal osteoporotic marrow defect. When I was young, uh, we were calling these hematopoietic marrow defects. And then I put it, I had all of this stuff and there were radiolucencies and sometimes this is all it was, was a localized area of osteoporosis. But 80% of them were fatty marrow. There was no hematopoietic marrow anywhere. So I had to come up with a new name for that, focal osteoporotic marrow defect. That seems to be the one that is stuck. And these are just these uh, very ill-defined uh, radiolucencies. A lot of them are in old extraction sites where it's just a poor healing. And the extraction was decades earlier. So I have to assume that the ischemia that was producing that, I mean, there are certain hormone deficiencies that can do the same thing. but. Uh, in my experience, at least, it's been local ischemia that's been doing this. And it must have been going on back when they were in their 20s and had those wisdom teeth removed. So um, this is uh, what we see microscopically, just almost no bone. And the fatty marrow is perfectly normal. However, in that 600 cases that I have put together for a paper, about 82% of them have ischemic damage. They have this fibrosis. They have dilated capillaries in the marrow. And so uh, th th I think this is an ischemic disease, a very low-grade one. And then, of course, sometimes when you remove a tooth decades later, you still see the socket outline. And uh, that had never been reported. With bisphosphonate, sometimes you still see this a uh, year or two after a tooth is extracted. And that's where my experience uh, came in. But I had in my unknown file a whole bunch of cases that were, had old residual sockets. And so I just collected a bunch of those and I reported 75 of them a couple of years ago. And I'd say about 40% were hollow, totally empty, as you see here. And the others were the lamina dura, the socket bone was still in place, but there was immature new bone in the middle, never really matured filling up the socket with fatty marrow around it. And then the rest were fibrous scars. Just um, if you have an ischemic area, fibrosis is what you're going to get. And this is all part of the NICO picture. This, um, what I now, now use to refer, uh, the term I use instead of NICO as well as a variety of specific histologic terms, but chronic ischemic bone disease would be my overall umbrella term for this right now. And this is uh, what 
I was talking about in some of those sockets. This is immature bone, but it doesn't have any, it would be like the bone you would find in a socket that's healing normally maybe four or five weeks after the extraction. But there's no more osteoblastic activity. The fibrous tissue of new bone is not there. It's replaced by just fat cells. And uh, it is, uh, and, and we have a lot of dilated vasculature, which tells me there's backup pressure and the blood is not moving very well through this tissue. So uh, I've had to come up with several names over the years. None of them seem to fit. Stagnant new bone is the one that I'm using right now. Poorly forming new bone is another term. It's just not been reported. And it took somebody who had not only access to a lot of marrow samples, but marrow samples from the jaws. They're really unique bones. And then, of course, we're into the bronze world where bisphosphonate related and medication related osteonecrosis of the jaws. It does tell you something, right? It's bronze. It's not just bron. We haven't found any of this in any other bones. There are people who, have, uh, who are on bisphosphonates who have been helped because they have some ischemic bone marrow problems. And there are a few people who have had green stick fractures who have been taking Fosamex for years. A green stick fracture, they're, they're just, for example, one woman was on the New York subway holding on to the strap and they just, she lurched, uh, the car lurched and she heard both of her thighs snap. And uh, it's a nice, clean fracture. There are about 20, 25 cases of that that have been reported with bisphosphonates. Otherwise, it's just the world of dentistry that has to deal with it. And I think we are dealing with it. Is my time up? No? I can stop any time. And I'm old, so I want to stop. <laughs> It's better to give the other speaker some time. Well, that's just been a little bit of my weird uh, lifetime experience. There's more uh, on this PowerPoint presentation. And after I went through th sort of this lifetime personal experience, then there's a regular Nico lecture that uh, gives, it's just an update of what's happened uh, to date. So it's a long PowerPoint, and I've only reached about 40% of the way through it. Thank you for your attention.